Alrighty, hey folks, and I've got that banner up and I am hiding it now, and how is it going? My name is Rosendo from MLH, as you probably already know, and it is just about that time to start the next Linode workshop that is scheduled for today, strengthening your server security. So I hope you all have been enjoying Global Hack Week thus far. I know I've been having a great time talking with you all on the chat, on the streams and whatnot, and seeing how everyone's doing on Discord. Uh, don't forget to check in and register for this workshop here. And we've got the link right up here as well. Make sure to get in there and get some credit for being here today. And also make sure that you know you check out the description because this is gonna be another great one. Just like yesterday, we are gonna be picking up right where we left off, but also including some awesome new content that y'all are gonna definitely wanna stick around for. So um, yeah, I mean, how's everyone doing out there? Where's everyone joining us from? All right, aerosol can. Always happy to see you. Hey, hey. All right. Well, India. India is in the house. We like it. New York, myself. A little, a little hot in this room, but it's all good. I'm sure it's hot over there as well. Nigeria. I love it. Oh, Japan. Wow. We've got the global... We got the global committee up in the chat today, and I love to see it. We got Jersey in there as well. It's not a party without Jersey in the house. So, yes. All right, y'all. Well, that's going to be it for me for now. I'm going to be in the chat. I'm going to be, you know, responding to y'all to your comments and stuff like that. And also, Jay's going to be doing the same thing. And you know, I'm speaking of that. I'm just going to go ahead and get him up here so he can go ahead and take it away. So, there you go. Take it away, Jay. Hey there. How's everybody doing? So it's so great to be back yet again for another session. We're going to continue where we left left off yesterday. But even if you didn't um, attend or couldn't make last time um, the last session, there's going to be a link popping up pretty quick that will basically have the instructions for how we built the server yesterday. So again, if you didn't see that, you'll have all the instructions. Even if you want to follow, follow along later, you can do that. We set up a NextCloud server last time. And the idea today is to secure that server. But um, we ran into, or I should say, I ran into a little bit of a problem last time. And I'll talk about that. And uh, I'll talk about some of my findings since then. But before we get into any of that, um, for those of you that um, are not familiar with who I am, my name is Jay, um, sometimes known as Jay the Linux guy. That's my Twitter handle. Um, I think that's probably because I like Linux or something like that. Um, well, actually, I've been using Linux for about, uh, I don't know how many years, over two decades, uh, something like that. I've had a career in system administration, DevOps, um, all the way up to director of operations. But I like to teach. So Learn Linux TV, my company, is now my only gig. So I'm literally paid to uh, train people and teach people things. And there's just nothing greater than teaching. It's the most awesome thing on the planet. Um, on my YouTube channel that... Um, you know, also named Learn Linux TV. There's hundreds of videos there. So if uh, you guys haven't already subscribed to that, haven't been to the website, definitely do that. There's no charge. There's no sign-up form. There, the videos are just there. You can just start watching them, start learning. I don't ask for any money for those YouTube videos. It's YouTube. It's free. Uh, I also write books. Mastering Ubuntu Server 4th Edition is going to be out in a month or two. So we're getting near the end of that process. So um, needless to say, I am, you know, heavily focused on Linux. So Today's session will also be heavily focused on Linux as well. Now, just to kind of recap a little bit, uh, last time it was all about setting up a NextCloud server. NextCloud is a really amazing piece of software with all kinds of plugins and add-ons that you can install. So it's a, a web, web app, basically, an app you can host on a web server. But it's more than just like a website or a blog. I mean, those things are cool too, but... We're talking about features like calendar, contacts, and you could also sync that with your smartphone and you control that. So you're basically creating your own cloud platform to you know, have your own cloud. It used to actually be named own cloud, long story. Now it's known as next cloud, that's what it is. And that's what we set up last time. <clears throat> and I'm setting this up on Linode. So I'm you know, so grateful for Linode um, you know, being a part of this with me. They've been a sponsor of my channel, but they're a sponsor because I actually use their services. My entire business runs on that. So that, that should tell you how confident I am in Linode. 
Now, last time on Linode, we set up a Nextcloud server. Again, you know, the URL is there for those of you that didn't get a chance to see that. Even if you don't have a Linode account, there's a credit. You can get um, $100 of free credit, which um, is good for up to 60 days. So that account um, credit is good for whatever happens first, whether you reach the 60 days or you use up the $100 credit. So there's a link for that. But even if you, for some reason you can't get an account, you can still follow along with the VirtualBox VM, a physical server. None of the commands that I went over yesterday are specific to Linode. But, um, you know, it's a great platform to host pretty much anything on, so I highly recommend it. Now, yesterday we ran into a little issue, and this is the interesting thing about what I do. I prefer to run in, into problems when people are watching because it gives me an opportunity to um, show you guys how we work through problems. And that what that's basically the idea is that I had yesterday is we'll use it as a learning opportunity. But it went an interesting way though, because the the thing I hate the most in this industry is when things start working for no reason. Because if things just, you know, kind of start working, you don't really know what went wrong. You can't troubleshoot something that's working. It's like taking your car into a mechanic and it has this annoying problem, but the minute you get to the mechanic, the car's fine, right? So right after I ended the the stream. It started working fine, and the entire day is working fine, and then it um, broke again. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my theory on why that might be the case. But um, yeah, I'll just look for some quick questions before we get started, and then I'll show you the Nextcloud server, the final one, the one that works now. And then we'll get into the main topic at hand today, which is going to be security, because if we have an awesome you know, web app like Nextcloud, we want to secure that. We don't want someone to break in and break it. We want to keep that around. So, um, yeah, and he asked, uh, Mechanic asks, what's, what's the problem? Um, oh, sorry, I misread that comment. Right, because the mechanic will say, what's the problem? Talking about my analogy earlier where you bring a car, you know, you have to be able to you know, reproduce a problem or have the problem actually being a, an occurrence to fix it. Otherwise, it's, you can't fix something that's working, right? So um, that being said, what I'm going to do right now, and I'll just peek for questions in a bit here, but I'm going to switch my camera over to my screen. So you should see my laptop screen right now. So basically what you're seeing, fortunately and unfortunately, is a different Nextcloud server. This is not the one that we worked on yesterday. And you could tell that because if you remember from yesterday, the, the domain was nextcloud.learnlinux.cloud. But right now, in the browser, you see it's nc, so abbreviated, nc.learnlinux.cloud. It's a new server. So the theory that I have after spending some time with this is that something happened during the initial in, or, or initialization of Nextcloud. There's a part where um, I chose to install the um, recommended apps. And it took a long time. I, I do remember it sometimes taking a minute or two, but I don't know, it was something like five minutes. It was just um, a ridiculous amount of time compared to what it normally is. So I went through the process of setting up the server again the same way. And that that step took 30 seconds at most one minute. It was fast. So what I think was happening is while Nextcloud was doing its initial initialization, Something didn't get initialized properly. I, I don't know if, if something happened to the network. There's just no way to know because I, I just literally copied and pasted the same commands from yesterday into a brand new instance and everything was perfect. I, I had no problems at all. So what you're seeing right now is that Nextcloud server. So I figured we could kind of start off with what I wanted to show you guys yesterday at the end of the session, which is showing you Nextcloud, which is what you see right now. I'm actually logged into it. And the screen that you see right now is a is the first screen that comes up when you set it up for the first time, which we did not see yesterday because we couldn't even get into it. So continuing from there, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and scroll through this little uh, welcome screen here. Just basically gives you an overview of some of the features. So um, for example, if I just blow this up. Um, which is probably blown up a little bit too much there. But anyway, you can see some of the features here. And there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, enterprise speak because it's used in the enterprise, but you don't have to have a company to use Nextcloud. Nextcloud is great for home users as well. So it really doesn't matter. Um, 
it, who knows? You might use it at home and then recommend it to your company and maybe uh, they'll use it. It's free. You don't have to pay for it. Uh, you just have to maintain the server and it's just fun to maintain servers. So we're talking about groupware apps like calendar contacts and mail. Um, so in regards to mail, it has the ability to pull in your mail. So if you have like an SMTP email service that you subscribe to, you can get your email right into Nextcloud. There's also uh, document editing, which it mentions. So it's it actually features collaborative document editing, which is great, um, especially for study sessions. I think it'd be really cool if people um, within the chat room, because you guys are from all over the world. I mean, literally, like, remember names of the people that are chatting with you, because how cool would it be to just set up a NextCloud server and have some people from all over the world just help, you know, learn with them, take notes with them, and then you get, you could take notes right in Nextcloud in one document together, even though you're not in the same room. So there's a lot of use cases here that I think would be perfect for the interest um, that we have in the chat room. And um, if I go blank every now and then, it's um, you know allergy season in Michigan in the United States. So um, you know don't want you guys to hear me sniffling or anything like that. Anyway, continuing, there's other add-ons. There's just so many things you could do in Nextcloud, like it mentions a music player. So if you, you know, copy MP3s to it, you can listen to them right there. Ebooks. So if you have a lot of IT books, like I do, I read a lot too. Um, there's an EPUB reader, a PDF reader. So many cool things. And also, there's desktop apps. There's apps for your uh, smartphone. If you're on Android, and a lot of people might like to use Android, but they don't like to use the Google Play Store. Well, they got you covered because it's, uh, according to this, it's uh, available on F-Droid. So if you want to um, go, you know, sidestep Google Play, if that's your thing, which a lot of people do that, then you can do that here. And some desktop environments on Linux even support NextCloud out of the box without anything needing to be installed. So you can basically sync your files between computers as well. I'm just going to skip out of this. <clears throat> and this is the primary screen right here. So we have the dashboard. So it's giving me this, you know, kind of overview kind of thing here. If you click on files, this is a really cool thing here. You can upload files to your Nextcloud server. For my company, when I um, am working on a video, if it's a collaborating type of thing, I might, you know, have footage here. So one of the examples of this is I did a, you know, April Fools. I always go all out. So I did a video for April 1st called Dad Joke Linux. I, I just made it look like a distribution of Linux that actually exists, but it completely does not exist in any way, shape, or form. But I had some people that wanted to be, you know, have cameos in that video, and we shared cameos and files via Nextcloud because it's just a great way to do that. And files are synchronized if you want to synchronize files, but if nothing else, you have a place to store things, which is pretty cool. So other apps, we have a photo viewer. <clears throat> And these are the recommended apps that are installed, not all of them that you can get. But you can see we have contacts, calendar, mail, and all the things that I mentioned. Another thing that I wanted to show you guys is that there's kind of like an app store in Nextcloud. So look at all these cool things, all these categories here of things that you can install. So when I mentioned that there's all kinds of things you could do with, with a Nextcloud server, I mean, look at this. I wasn't kidding. Um, to click on Office, we can install the Office support, which actually is already installed. So actually, all of these are installed, which is great. There's integration, encryption. I could go on and on. But today's topic is about security. So that's actually what we're going to focus on, is increasing the security of this server. And nothing that I'm going to go over in terms of security is specific to NextCloud. This is just your Linux server things in general. So um, even if you don't have a Nextcloud server, just, you could take notes. That's fine. If you have another server you maintain, that's fine too. Because the things that I'm going to go over, they actually uh, fit other use cases as well. So to get right into it, the first problem that we have is that there's no SSL certificate here. This is absolutely something that I recommend for everything. Now, one counter argument to this is that some someone might have a website for example that's a static page it never changes you know just some generic information there's nothing private there nothing secure at all it could be your favorite recipe for gourmet pizza you just want the world to know about it right you don't care that the information is everywhere you want it to be everywhere 
in that case, someone might say, well, what's the point of securing it? Because I don't put any personally identifiable information onto that server. And it's just one web page. It's, it's not even a website. It's a web page. I can understand that argument. But then also, you know, if your intent is to get something out there in the world, uh, search engines may and often do deprioritize your listing because you're not secure. They, they don't know if your site has personal information in it or not. So it's really a good idea to, to basically secure everything. And it used to be kind of a challenge because you'd have to buy a certificate, you have to install it, and you know, creating your own full chain. I mean, there's so many things. It, it could be kind of mind numbing to some people if that's not their focus. But thankfully, Let's Encrypt is something that we can use that's easy and it gives us that security. It checks that box. So we have uh, TLS, SSL basically in our web app. Now, yesterday we did that as part of the session. So when I created this server here for today, just to you know, prove that it works and I'm not going insane and it actually, um, the steps are fine. I purposely did not do the, uh, do the uh, let's encrypt portion because I felt like that's a great place to start. So that's where we'll start right now. So here, again, we have the URL, nc.learnlinux.cloud. We have the padlock here, which is probably too small for anyone to be able to see it. But if you've ever seen an, an insecure site, you know exactly what that looks like. It's a padlock with a red line going through it. It's letting you know, this isn't good. We need to secure this. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and do that part right here. So let me find, yep, here it is. So I'm logged in as root. I probably shouldn't be logged in as root to follow my own advice. But I am logged in right here via SSH to the new server that was created the same exact way as it was yesterday. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is walk through the process. This is going to be a repeat of what we went over yesterday, but I'll try to make this part quick so we can get to the newer things that I want to go over. Uh, Let's Encrypt is a technology, a tool that gives you a well, a certificate, it gives you that security, but we have to install it first. And it's distributed via Snap. Snap packages are an alternative Linux package format that's universal. Um, there, there's some you know, controversy recently about you know, them. Sometimes they're being, those apps are slow, not going to get into that. But when it comes to server apps like you know, CertBot for Let's Encrypt, it's, it's very fast. I haven't noticed any problems at all. So what we're gonna do is uh, just run sudo apt install just in case it's not already installed, it almost always is with Ubuntu. And that's what this is, is Ubuntu 20.04. You wanna make sure SnapD is installed. That's how we install the CertBot utility that we'll be using. <clears throat> and it's already installed, I kind of figured it would be. So next, there's some prerequisites that we need to install. So uh, what we'll do is install, let's see, snap install core, and sudo snap refresh core. Need that core snap that um, it depends on. So we're just going to grab that. So this might take a moment. Yes, we're going to talk about firewalls. So just looking at some of the comments here. Um, see what I can see here. Flat packs are great, by the way. Aerosol can. Uh, I, I love them. I, I use them a lot. So that's a good one, too. Um, yep, we'll be looking at firewalls. It's kind of interesting that this is taking a, a minute here because um, I've never seen this happen before. I love these problems that just kind of creep up when you've done something hundreds of times. And because you're doing it live, it's like, yeah, there's going to be um, some kind of delay or some kind of thing, but it, it's working. It must have just took a minute to get started. So we'll let it download. And, you know, it's kind of funny. It, it took a lot of time for this to install right when I was saying that I didn't notice any slowdown in Snap, at least in terms of um, setting this up. And then, yeah, that, that happened. Irony, right? So anyway, we have that done. So what I'm going to do now is install CertBot. This is the actual program that will facilitate the installation of the certificate. We've already gone over this. Um, I probably should actually type that correctly. We've gone over this yesterday, so I'm going through this um, a little bit quicker than I would normally. 
Oh, gosh, that's embarrassing. Let me start over. I duplicated the end of that command. Um, and these are the things that I always edit out of the videos that you, you guys never see. Like, I, I just make all kinds of typos. And anyone who watches my videos would probably think, like, I type everything perfectly every single time. And that's only because I edit out my mistakes. Um, so it's kind of funny. Can't do that live. Not really. Yep. Realism, I think, is is probably good. Uh, I, I definitely agree with that. I just never wanted people to start typing what I'm typing if it's wrong. Anyway. Interesting thing. So I was installing the CertBot snap right now. So we're just waiting for that to finish. Sometimes I wonder if it would be a great feature to have some kind of music. I, I don't know. I'm thinking of like the Jeopardy music while I'm waiting for something to install. That'd be kind of interesting, but probably get old after a while. I always wonder, uh, like one year I read that the average person waits 50 hours a year waiting for things to load on their computer. And that that was probably over a decade ago that I read that. So it's obviously not true now. But I was thinking at the time, if people wait 50 hours a year on average waiting for things to load, how long do I wait? I do this all the time. All day long, probably more than most. Uh, I probably spend, I, I kind of don't even want to know how long I spend uh, waiting for things to finish. <clears throat> now, while we're waiting, um, if anyone has any questions that I can answer, just keep putting your questions into the chat as soon as you uh, think of one. You know, you don't have to wait or anything like that. I'll scroll through and unless it gets crazy, I'll scroll through and answer them as I see them. What are your favorite and uh, in, in top technology books that you recommend? I really like the SSH Mastery book from uh, Michael Lucas, actually. And uh, he self-publishes, which is great. I, I have an actual publisher, but I, I'm kind of envious because he does that all himself. So it's called SSH Mastery. And even if you know how to use SSH, if you read that book, you will learn things that you didn't even know you could do. And you, you didn't even know you could... So since you didn't know you could do it, you're not going to Google things you didn't know something you can do. It'll enlighten you in terms of things that you could do with SSH. Uh, for example, SSH um, match statements, for example, are very common, or actually not common, but are mentioned in that book. So that's a good one. Uh, there was a book, Subnetting Made Easy, but that was so long ago. Um, I would start with that. And also, if you're into ZFS, Michael Lucas has a book on that as well. Um, obviously, I'd recommend my own book, but you know that I'd be a little biased. UbuntuServerBook.com. I did forget to mention that earlier, legitimately. Um, anyway, we have an error here. Let me go ahead and see if I can rerun this command. <clears throat> if not, I'll just move past this, and we'll just go on to something else. If uh, there's something upstream, it's interesting when you have a problem that you can't control, and I'll give you a an example. That actually happened to me. Um, so I had, basically I used something called Ansible to configure all of my servers and machines. And I started getting some failures, which is interesting because I didn't change anything. So that's always weird when something starts to fail, but you weren't even working on it. And when I looked at the errors, I found out that the VirtualBox website just a couple of days ago was down. So when it was checking to make sure VirtualBox was installed on the things that needed to have it, it couldn't get to the VirtualBox website to see what the version was, so it started failing. So because VirtualBox, the website itself went down, then my build scripts are failing. And that's out of my control because I don't maintain their server. Uh, just like here, there's clearly something going on with trying to install CertBot, as you can see. So I'm going to just move off of this for now, and I'll come back to this later. We could definitely try this. But I, what I want to do is kind of move on to some other topics that I feel like are very important. Now. One thing that I want to mention first and foremost is that updates, like your security updates, do not wait to install them. They're often made for a real reason, and it's often hard to update a server because if you don't have like a load balancer and multiple servers, then if you take down the server for an update, then customers can't get to your website. And that's a problem, right? 
if you're doing it right, then you could have like, I don't know, three servers. So you just update one, you reboot it. When that one comes up, you reboot the second one after updating that one, and then you kind of move through them. And that means your customers, if you're doing it right, will not see downtime. But regardless, and especially if you're you know getting into the industry, you're going to probably notice that a lot of executives and managers just squirm when you mention updates and restarting servers. And I understand the uh, stigma there. I know why they feel that way, but security updates are very important because people are trying to get in. So just make sure you have those installed. Uh, you could just look up any video or you just look up the command for updates. So it's not really much to go over for that. What I'm gonna do though, is move on to firewalls. And um, <clears throat> we're actually gonna look at this, but real quick, uh, aerosol can, going back to that uh, match statement, it's such an uh, inter interesting thing to do because if you have an SSH server, which most servers are gonna have that because that's how we get into those servers to maintain them, uh, you, you have settings in there. That, and, it, the, and those settings in the SSH daemon config file apply to everything on the server. But you can actually have match statements that'll, it's, it's almost like the best way to explain it, you have your settings that are global, but there might be a setting you only want applied in a certain use case or situation where you don't want that setting to be you know, server-wide, that's what a match statement allows you to do in a nutshell. Um, uh, the book I mentioned, SSH Mastery, will go into that and explain it better than I ever could because that's actually something I should cover in an um, open SSH video. I've already done an open SSH video, but I didn't get to the more advanced things. That's one of the advanced things that you can do. All right, so let's talk about firewalls. Before I show you the firewall system here in Linode, I want to give you guys some general information because there's some misinformation about firewalls. I would suspect, though, that none of you have this misinformation in mind that you probably all or the majority of you probably know this, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention it at least because there's um, when XP, Windows XP, I think it was Service Pack 2 came out. I'm pretty sure that was the one that put a firewall on everybody's Windows installation, which is a good thing. I mean, th that should be the case anyway. But what ended up happening is that just conditioned users to say, yes, allow, yes, allow, yes, allow. Every time a message comes up, they're trying to get to something, trying to do something. Yes, yes, yes. They always click yes. Um, and that works fine until you're clicking on yes or allowing something through the firewall. That really, you shouldn't, right? But, but then users are getting inundated with all these prompts. And that created this misinformation that having a firewall, just actually having one is, is what you need. But nowhere, at least at that time, would people really focus on the configuration of the firewall because how you set the firewall up is what makes the most sense, right? So I'll give you a perfect example of that. I'm gonna create a firewall right here. And of course, IP tables and all of those, you could definitely do that. The thing is, if you're using a cloud platform, my personal opinion, based on my experience, is use the firewall that comes with the cloud platform. If you have your own physical server, your own VM stack, absolutely use IP tables. But if a cloud platform makes something available to you as a service, you're already using a cloud, a cloud platform to you know, use it as a service. So there's other things that it makes available as a service. Yes, you can absolutely roll your own IP tables and it'll be great. It'll be fine, nothing wrong with doing that. But you're going to be doing a little bit more work to set that up than you would just to use the thing that they created for you. And generally speaking, their API will allow you to manage that uh, with configuration management tools all the same. So that's why I'm using this. But the logic I'm going to go over applies to others as well. So now what I'm going to do is just create a firewall called uh, NextCloud. And what I want to do is, I'm not going to apply it to the server yet. I'm just going to create it and not apply it to anything because I just want to show you guys the logic first. When you have a firewall, going back to my original point, where I mentioned that simply having a firewall is not good enough. You have to know how to configure it. Thankfully, though, when it comes to the mindset of configuring a firewall, it's pretty basic when you distill it down to the most basic thought process which is what do you want to allow and from where? For example, if you have a website 
for your company or maybe your own website, your own blog, and you want everyone to access that, then what you should do absolutely is allow everyone, the public, to your website. So that way they can get to it. Otherwise, they can't. So, for example, HTTP, that's a um, that's on, insecure. That's port 80. But, you know, that's part of the Internet. So we're going to allow that. We're going to accept that traffic. So this will make sure that web traffic gets in. So I'll add that rule. And since I don't have this applied to any server at all, nothing I'm adding here actually applies to anything yet. We're just setting up the firewall. It's good to set it up before you apply it. Otherwise, you know, interesting things might happen. Let's also add another rule. I want to add one for HTTP secure. That's another popular one there too. And now here, what we have is that port 80 and port 443 are allowed from anywhere. This is a public site. I want everyone to be able to access that. Alternatively, if it was not a public site, for example, and many don't think about, about it this way, if you think of an intranet site that you can only access when you're, you know, if you work at a, in an office, you're at the office, you can access it there. You can access it from home. Uh, considering that like an intranet site for a company might have HR information, it might have your paycheck information in there. You, you, you'll probably be happy to know that uh, as long as it's set up correctly, an intranet site can only be accessed by people at the company and can't be accessed outside of that, which is a great thing. So you, you could have that. And if you do have that, then you would not want to just accept traffic. What you would do instead is you um, actually go through here and where it says, all IPv4 and other firewalls have the same thing. So, you know, the same logic will apply. You could say IP slash net mask. So let's just say your company's network could be, and these are just, I'm making these numbers up. I don't even know if they're in spec, but anyway, we'll just say maybe you have a slash 24 network. This isn't a network overview. You could allow your company's network into this um, or a specific IP address even. And then um, you change the end of slash 32, which means one host in this case. So you can narrow this down to one host, or you can widen up the subnet at the end, which means, you know, in this case, 254 addresses and so on as you go down. But again, this is not a networking tutorial, but it's just part of the process. I'm not going to save this right here. It's just an example. If you wanted to lock something down to a, a particular IP, which we will be doing, you can do that. But usually for most companies with a public web server, they, they want that to be publicly accept, um, publicly available. But the, the goal here is to only allow the things in that we want people to access. We want people to access the web server, but we don't want people to access it when it comes to the remote management console, typically SSH. We don't want that publicly available. We, do, we just don't. And, and to give you an idea of why, uh, what I'm going to do, let's just bar, um, let's just cat this log out right here. This is the, um, actual auth log and other Linux distributions, we'll call it something different. But already there's an attempt to log into the server via user Steam. Like that's literally just somebody trying usernames. Uh, we call this internet background noise. And this person is trying, like they must think that, and, and what I assume here based on this is that, you know, why would someone think that Steam is a user that I would have? But the, um, you know, we have that portable uh, Steam, uh, what was that called again? There, I know somebody in the chat room will mention it, but Steam has a portable handheld game system now. I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of it. And because of that, and it runs Linux, yeah, Steam Deck, thank you. Thank you so much. Because that's coming out, I could probably assume, even though I've never used a Steam Deck, that maybe there's a user named Steam, just saying, on that distribution. So because they see a new Linux server, is that a Steam Deck? Let's find out. And they're trying to get in. That's just how it goes. If I scroll up, you're going to see other people trying to get in. You see their, the, you know, the IP addresses. Uh, there's somebody trying the username server, somebody trying the username user. So people are trying to get into this. And they're not able to get in because they don't have the password. We'll, we'll be fixing that. But they're trying to get in via SSH. Now, in this example, we have a web server. We want Again, we want people to view the website. But we do not want people to log into something that we use to manage the server. If it's our server, we want to do that. And that's what an effective firewall is. It allows people in that you want in, but it actually restricts the things that you don't want people to access. So what I'm going to do is just go in here and create another fire, uh, firewall rule. SSH is the first one. So we're, it says accept inbound SSH. 
but I absolutely do not want IPv4 and you know all IPv4 and IPv6 addresses to access this. They're literally trying to do that. I mean, we we literally uh, see that right here. So it's not me being paranoid here. This is a real problem. And this is among the first things that you want to secure. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to drop this down and I'm going to select IP net mask. I want to lock this down to one IP, but what IP do I want to lock it down to? Well, there's a website ICANN has, I think it is IP, which was a play on an old uh, cat meme back in the day. Um, IP dot, what is the domain on that, dot com. So it's just ICANN has IP dot com, I believe. And it gives me my IP address, which for some reason I can't uh, memorize this. I can do this because I have a static IP. This IP does not change. So unless I want to change it. And that makes that kind of hard for most people because if you have residential internet, you probably don't have a static, so you can't do that. Um, but I, I can get away with that. So if you can get away with that, you you should be able to do that. If you if you don't have a static IP, you can set up a VPN server on Linode or wherever and just make that the only thing that can access the server. So you can still have your cake and eat it too with this. But in this example, I am locking SSH down to just that IP. And this is probably what's going to make, if it didn't already click with you guys, uh, for any of you that are just starting out, this should kind of make it click right here because this is how you manage a firewall. You look at what's running. What's you know We have a web server here. We want that publicly accessible. But again, we don't want SSH publicly accessible. So we're going to, we're going to block everybody but this IP for this. And we're going to allow these right here. But again, this is not applied to an instance. This is just a firewall. We didn't even add it to an instance yet. So um, for example, if anyone wants to try to use SSH to get into the server, um, you, you can't do that unless you're you know already a hacker, then you absolutely can get in because you don't have the password yet. But what you can do is you could do nc.learnlinux.cloud. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to follow mode. Let me clear my screen, actually. So if you guys, anyone out there, I'm going to create a bunch of blank space. If you have an SSH client hit this server right now, just go ahead and just, just try users. Um, try whatever you want to try, right? Um, obviously, Keep it uh, work safe for the names. Don't don't be that person, uh, please. But if you guys have an SSH client, just go ahead and uh, go in. It's NC, so N is in Nancy, C is in Charlie. Dot Learn Linux. Dot Cloud. So um, let me go ahead and see if that's in here in the private chat. Um, one sec. All right. So that should show up in the comments here soon. And you could point your SSH client to that, right? And what you're going to see as you guys do this, you're going to see the attempts from everyone in the output on the screen as people try it. So what I would like for you guys to do is just keep trying. Uh, whoever wants to do it, as many of you that wants to do it, please just try. Uh, that'll make the make it scroll. And you, you can see how it's scrolling right now, right? Look at all these people trying. Look at you guys trying to get into the server. You're making this output happen right now as you try, because this is follow mode. So the output on my screen is going to update as the log is being written to. So as you guys try, the log gets written to, right? So you're trying all kinds of things here. You're trying to get in. Um, now watch. Now keep trying, but watch what happens when I go here to Linode's. Actually, um, I didn't save the changes yet, so let me do that. Okay, so I'm going to apply the firewall to that instance right now. So back down here. You know, you guys are trying to get in, aren't you? Right? Now watch what happens when I add this firewall. I'm going to add some space. So keep trying. At some point, I'm just not going to see any more output. It's probably going to time out more than likely, if I had to guess. So I see hi, Jay, in there. That's pretty cool. And this is also a way to test whether or not, you know, something is working. So we have, let me actually update this and change it to, oh, TCP is fine. If you guys are trying UDP, it's going to absolutely still show um, things. But right now, let's see, the time is 
and my time is 143. So I see something there, 143, 44. So I see some people still trying here. So you guys are still, see, this is what I love about security. You guys are still able to do this. And this is what happens in the real world. So let me go ahead and double check that I have the syntax. 32 will be assumed for IPv4. So if you're doing any IP masquerading or anything like that, you can absolutely get in there. Um, we have the IP address I copied in there. And they don't take effect immediately. So there's a little bit of a delay here, it looks like. But let me go back down here and see what you guys got going on. And see, this is why you want to test a firewall. And this is exactly my point as why you, you don't want to assume just by having a firewall that you're good. You just don't want to assume that at all. So what I'm going to do is just see, and if anybody wants to chime in, this would be fun. Um, I actually have it on accept. That's hilarious. That is so hilarious. See, even people like me, we make mistakes too. We want to drop that traffic. So no wonder that wasn't working. That is funny. Okay. So even I make mistakes, right? So keep trying. Yeah, keep trying, guys. At some point, it's just you're just going to start timing out. So we have it on drop. Actually, it was supposed to be accept. I was right the first time. Ha ha! That's what you get for questioning yourself. So I'm accepting it for that. Now we now the problem is actually our default is accept. That was the problem. See. So by default, we want to drop. And here we want to accept only from this IP here, but we definitely want to accept these from everywhere. But this one is specific to an IP address, the one I, I have uh, for this session, and the default is drop. So that's the reason why you guys are still able to get in. So what about now? Yep, so you guys are still able to get in to the server. We have an authentication error here, and Already, we see hi J again. Arch, by the way, of course, we, we got to have that in there as well. Did I actually save the changes? nc.learnlinux.cloud. Yep, so we have somebody trying root. So we have people that are trying to get in. Um, actually, again, here we are. Outbound. Okay, so let, let me start over. I got a little bit caught up in fascination of watching you guys actually get into the server that I was just having so much fun with that. Um, I was too excited. So let's save the changes now. Outbound, we accept. I'll tell you why. Because if you have a server that is downloading updates, it has to make an outbound connection to get those out updates. We, we need that. So outbound server to the internet, I don't mind. Default inbound, I set to drop. That was set to accept. So by default, it's going to drop everything unless it applies to one of those rules there. So now let's see what you guys are able to do. So. Go ahead and try to get into the server now. So we have someone already. So Aerosol Can is um, letting us know it's timing out, which it should be. So this is why you want to test a firewall. Don't just assume you did it right. Like I was so excited if I left this as it is, it would have been wide open, um, for example. So, th so this is why we test things. And yep, so we have another person timing out. You guys can't get in anymore. So. Nobody else but me can get in. So if I was to open up a tab, um, let me just use uh, SSH nc.learnlinux.cloud. I'll say yes. So I'm able to do it. So I'm able to get in, and that's great because I'm the administrator of the server. I need to get in. Now, obviously, if I you know don't type the right password, of course, I'm not going to get in at all. Let me fix that, and now I'm in. So I was able to do that, but you guys are timing out. So that's how you do a firewall. That's what you want. You want the public things to be public and the private things to not be accessible from outside people. Now, the problem with this when it comes to server security is that I don't care if you are the best security admin in the world, right? Actually, if you're best in the world, then you're the best in the world. But if you're like among the, the most elite when it comes to security-minded people, it's still possible for someone else to know more than you because there's always somebody that knows more than you. There's there's people that know more than me. There's people that know more than anyone out there. They they might still try things and, and people do. 
So what you're trying to do is to have the best security that you possibly can, but it doesn't negate the need for backups. Some kind of way to have your servers like scale automatically or um, auto healing so they revive themselves or you know init scripts or um, even Ansible automation scripts if you do configuration management to use infrastructure as code to recreate your environment. If somebody does end up getting in and they break everything, which would be a horrible thing, but if your plans and your scripts, uh, disaster recovery, disaster prevention plans are good, it's still a shame if that happens, but you'll be up and running in no time and, and you still need to focus on that because there's no such thing as perfect security. So what could somebody do? And I'll let you guys um, chime in in the chat here. I have locked SSH down to my IP address, okay? Now, try to think of a theory of how somebody could still get around that. Because it feels to me, well, actually it doesn't because I know better, but it, it, it almost seems like getting in via SSH is impossible unless you're coming from my IP. But there might be a way around that. So what I'm going to do is see what you guys can come up with in the chat as far as ways that somebody on the outside could possibly get in. Aerosol can, I mentioned spoofing the IP. That's, that's a great one. That's absolutely a great one because um, you guys know what my IP address is. So that may not have been the best move on my part, but you know what? Um, go big or go home, right? But if someone was able to link that IP, because um, you know I could be at another office, a VPN connection, you don't know where that IP is. But if you knew that was, if that was my IP, well, yeah, you could absolutely try to spoof that. So if the firewall sees the connection coming in from an approved IP address, yeah, that could be something that somebody could do. <clears throat> and uh, someone mentioned that they could still end map. Now it depends on the um, type of traffic, whether it's UDP, TCP, um, for example, those things still matter. There's still gonna be edge cases for other things that we can access. But that being said, uh, what I'm gonna do is just close out of here and let's go back in here. They probably just should have stayed connected. Okay, so let's just think about some additional aspects of security that are important because a firewall is a great thing to have. So we have a good starting point here, but SSH is still kind of a problem though. Now check this out. I'm going to use sudo, I'll use nano because why not? It's an easy text editor. Etsy SSH, sshd underscore, underscore config. SSH is a huge focus to focus your attention on because it's the first thing anybody from the outside is going to try. Having the firewall is an amazing benefit because by you know blocking incoming connect connections to SSH that aren't from an improved IP, that's a great thing. But we're not done yet. We, I mean, what if somebody spoofed the IP, right? Um, that would be a bad day. They could then use a brute force technique to try to get in via the password. So there's some changes that we can make here with the SSH configuration that might help. Now, as an aside, there is one way to have perfect security with SSH, actually. I'll give you the secret. Just stop the service. Just kill it. Just, just make sure it's not running. People, you know, it's not even running now. Now, what's weird is I'm still connected, though. Actually, that's because an established SSH connection is still the case. I still have an established connection. But if I was to drop out of this connection, I wouldn't be able to reconnect. And anybody who wants to start a new connection wouldn't be able to do so either because it's not running. So if you have an alternate way to start the SSH service, then that's great, but that's not gonna be very common. So I'll start that back up before I lock myself out of it. Um, anyway, back here in the config file for SSH, since this is the first thing that people wanna try to break into, it's the first thing that we, su we should secure. And I'm gonna go over some of the most important things here that you definitely wanna pay attention to. Now, oops, I'm so used to using Vim. X is delete one character in Vim, and I'm here in Nano. Vim is my normal text editor. I was trying to uncomment this. By default, SSH is on port 22, okay? One of the first things that you can do to help the security of SSH is change this port to something else. But I wanna make sure I'm clear on the fact that um, if somebody wants to get into your server, Changing the port will probably only slow them down for less than one minute. They'll still get in if, if, if there's a way in. So I don't want to 
mislead you guys that changing the port adds a considerable amount of security. It really doesn't. It's pretty much um, barely any additional security at all. The only reason why I mention it and recommend it is because it's such an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, change this port, whatever you want to change it to. It's super easy. You just have to change the port number you connect to with, with SSH, the client. It defaults to port 22, unless you tell it otherwise. So if you put your SSH server on a different port, here's what's going to happen. You'll still get people trying to get in. That's not going to stop. That, that, that definitely will not stop. But fewer people will be trying to get in. So if you think about the automated scripts that are out there just scanning servers, they're just going to see that port 22 isn't open unless they're doing a full port scan. They're just going to move on to another server. Now, if there's a human being on the other end of that, they'll find out what port you're running in a matter of seconds. However, when you look at the logs, you're only going to see the more aggressive attempts. So if nothing else, this just lowers your log file down by a certain percentage. And considering it's an easy change to make, you may as well make that change. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep it simple here. But that's just something to keep in mind. But then the problem becomes, if you change the port, you also have to remember to update your firewall. Otherwise, depending on your firewall's configuration, you might be allowing everyone in again because you change the port, the firewall is looking at a certain port. Uh, my default policy is drop. So that's still not going to make a difference. It's, it's actually going to lock me out if I don't change that port number in the firewall. But just be mindful of that. And one thing to keep in mind is since SSH, if you have an, an established connection, um, since that's the case, if you're already connected, that restarting SSH doesn't drop you. That's also the case if you change the port number, because if you have an established connection, that'll remain. So what you could do is open up another terminal and test it, make sure it works. If it does, then you're okay to drop your original connection. But you definitely want to make sure you leave a connection open when you're messing with SSH, just in case you make a mistake. You have an established connection that you can use to get in and fix the problem. Um, considering how much of a klutz I am, and you've seen that earlier in the video, um, I'm quite a bit different in real life than in the videos because I can edit videos. I can't edit real time, right? So you saw me make some mistakes at the beginning where I had the wrong policy in the firewall, which was an example of why you want to test it, not assume that you do it right. Well, um, that's just how it goes, I guess. But let's move on to something that is better and a little bit more, actually, a lot more powerful than just changing the port. Permit root login, yes. You do not want this. If you've already created a secondary user for yourself and you've tested you can log in with that user, let's turn this off because root is absolutely a user everybody's going to try. Absolutely going to happen. We want to disallow that. Ubuntu by default, which is what this is, uh, it doesn't even allow login via root. The account is locked. But cloud providers use root and the reason why they do that is because you, as the admin, you might want UID 1000, the user ID 1000, which is the first user ID given. You might want that for your user. And since root is not UID um, 1000, which is the first non-root user, generally speaking, um, they want to leave that open for you. So they'll enable root, but you should totally shut root down. And at the very least, Say no to this. We don't want root login. So after you've already verified you have another user that you could use and it works, let's get rid of root login. We don't want that anymore. So now I go to, let's see, scroll through here, find the other one. Always forget where it's located. So most of these here, we want to kind of leave these settings alone because they're fine. It used to be the case that we had to check the version of SSH that we were using, but any modern distribution of Linux, they all use the same now. Um, protocol 2, so we're not going to mess with that. All right, so permit root login. Public key authentication, yes, we want that. Absolutely, we want that. If it's uh, commented out, it's a default, by the way. So unless I must be really blind. Um, ah, here it is, actually. Password authentication, yes. We want to disable that, but, but I'm not going to disable that right now, um, by no means, because, um, I mean, yeah, I can get in anyway because there's other ways to get into the server, but I don't have key authentication set up yet. So SSH should never, ever, ever have password authentication set to yes, unless it's your first time setting up the server and you know just make sure that disabling this is part of your workflow. But what I'm going to do, though, I'm going to leave this alone for now. 
and I'm going to save the file and close out. Because before we can do that, we need an SSH key. Otherwise, uh, we run into a problem. So SSH hyphen keygen. This is how you create an SSH key on Linux. Uh, Mac OS, I believe you could do the same thing. Windows is a little bit um, more interesting. I'm not going to get into that. Um, I don't have a Windows source machine to show you guys anyway. But I'm just going to run SSH keygen. And by default, it wants to create a key in this path right here that we see. Um, now, normally, I like to set a name for the key. So I'll, I, I might type, type the same first part of the path here. So home j at SSH. Uh, I, I'll just call this key, um, let's see, I'll just call it class key because we're using it for this class. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because it's common, commonly the case that you might already have a key at this default. I recommend everybody name keys so that way you never have a default name. Because if you accidentally run SSH keygen and press enter too quick, you could wipe out your key. That would be bad because you can't get in if you don't have your key. Um, that, that's not fun. But if we have a key by a different name, that's not the default. We don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to create class key. And then the passphrase, I'm going to just type one right now. And we'll break after this because I know we're, uh, some in individuals probably want to break by now. But we'll finish this part. So I entered a passphrase for the key. And what I'm going to do is add the key to my keychain, which I'm, and not all commands I remember off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's eval SSH agent is the is, is a utility you can have running in the background of your shell to remember your key. And it'll make sense in a moment. I'm going to run this command here. Agent PID. So an SSH uh, agent is running, and there's the uh, PID 271320 for that. Now, what that allows me to do is run SSH hyphen add. And I think it's dash I, let's see, class key. Let's add that key. Oops. Add, so that should be, let's try this. Aha. So I didn't have the dash I, I was thinking another command. So I'm typing in my passphrase right now. And it worked. So the key is in my session. It didn't do us any good right now um, yet, but the passphrase makes it impossible, at least with our current computing power, if somebody got a hold of our private key, without that passphrase, I can't use it. So if, if your key does leak and you do have a passphrase, you should still invalidate that key and delete it everywhere, um, just in case the other person has your passphrase. You just don't know. But the hope of the passphrase is that you're hoping that if someone does, unfortunately, get a hold of your key, they won't be able to use it without that passphrase because it's uh, it's locked. So I added the passphrase here. And what I'm going to do is add the key to the server. So I'll do that by typing SSH copy ID. And this is the dash I I tried earlier. Um, it was actually for this command. And then the path to the key. So my home directory called it class key. Um, I think I used up oh, the public key, of course. What did I do wrong? Class key dot P U B. And this is one of those moments when it's unscripted. It's like, what is going wrong? So SSH copy ID. If anybody wants to chime in why this isn't working, because it's one of those things where I'm sure it's probably right there on the tip of my tongue, but I'll just look at some comments anyway, and then we'll go through the rest of it. Um, and while I'm waiting, um, yellow table seven. ED25519, that is my preferred format. I'm basically just keeping it simple for this. Um, I feel like sometimes Linux can be overwhelming if you put too much information, and I know I'm just you know spouting out a bunch of information. However, um, you know that key type is preferred. I highly recommend that you Google that and use that format. It's uh, elliptic curve encryption, if that's something that you study. And um, let's see here. That is interesting. 
I thought it was that. Um, anyway, you know what? Because I, oh, of course, you know, get ahead of myself. I don't have the target server. That's hilarious. What server am I going to copy that to? Well, if I don't give it a server, then it doesn't know what the heck to do. So no wonder the, uh, yeah, the machine after. Um, it's just one of those things where, you know, you get excited and you forget something you've been doing every day for like your entire life. So absolutely, that was it. So RCT Rockefeller, you've got it. Um, you're the first one that I've seen mention that, unless someone else mentioned it before you. But basically what this is, is we're copying the public key over to, uh, we're actually creating a relationship, so to speak, by copying the key over to that server, which is going to allow us to use it for authentication in lieu of password. You can still use password authentication if you want, but I recommend you disable that. But anyway, um, it'll ask us for the password the first time, though. And that's OK. And that's why we didn't want to disable password auth authentication yet, because we wouldn't have been able to do this part, at least not as easily. Number of keys added one. OK. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to SSH into, into that server. Let's do that right now. Now, notice how it logged me in with no password prompt. We're using SSH key authentication um, in lieu of password authentication. Now, if this was to fail, like if I you know, could unlock my key or I, or I lost the key or something, um, since password authentication is still enabled, then, it's, then the, what it's going to do is try the key first. If that doesn't work, it'll default to the password. But we don't want the password ability at all. And just now, I tested the, the SSH key, and it works. And because it works, we can safely disable password authentication. So sudo nano, let's see, SSH, sshd underscore config, same file as before. We're going to go find our password authentication option. And let's see, where is that? Here it is. It's set to yes. So now that we have verified our keywords, let's set that to no. So I'm just saving the file. It's Control O if we didn't already know that. Now, none of the changes have taken effect yet. So we'll run sudo systemctl restart ssh. And this will, if you change the port, this is also what will make that take effect as well. I just moved it back to the default. You could use ssh or sshd on Ubuntu. Both will work. Um, so at this point, password authentication is disabled. There's no way to get in with a password. Even if you knew my password, wouldn't help you at all. But more importantly, what that allows us to do is disable, uh, I mean, we disabled passwords. So brute force attacks against SSH. There's different kinds of brute force attacks, so I can't say that none of them will work, but the majority of them will not. So that really adds a, a really good benefit. And I know we spent a lot of time on SSH, but that's important because SSH is the first thing that outside people will try to use against you. So what I'm going to do now is break. Uh, my time here, Eastern Time Zone, is 2.07 right now. So we'll come back, how about 2.15? So um, just over eight minutes there. And we'll go on a break. I will be sticking around. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, even if they're not specific to what we're going over right now, I'll be open to that. And then I'll see you guys back here if you want to break in about seven, eight minutes. So um, Aerosol Can, I was uh, curious, where are you seeing the outdated version? Because there should I should have already installed the updates. Let me double check that, though. I'm pretty sure I did that already. Sometimes distributions are slower getting newer versions of packages than I would like them to be. I run sudo apt update. So it doesn't surprise me if it's, if it's outdated, by the way. Yeah. So it's updated as of what Ubuntu has in their, um, their uh, repositories. Now, one thing to keep in mind with um, versions and... Actually, you know what? I'm going to hold that until people get in because that is such a great point right there that I absolutely need to address that. And I want to make sure everyone is back to hear my answer to it. So I'm going to hold your question until everyone gets back. 
and uh, I'll uh, answer it then. And by the way, um, you know, it's so cool that you mentioned the Apache version, but what I'm about to show you after I address that, we're going to find a whole lot more wrong with the server. We're going to find um, a lot of things that are wrong with the server that we should focus on. So that's just the beginning. From there, it's going to definitely get more interesting. So for anyone else that uh, didn't decide they needed a break, if there's any other, other questions, feel free to throw them over my way. I'm definitely going to mention that too because that worked that time. Oh yeah, we're gonna we're oh I'm you're you're asking all the right questions, aerosol can. I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving that. You are more than paying attention. Definitely love to see that. There's ways to do that, RCT Rockefeller. Absolutely. I'm gonna write, I'm gonna jot down a note so I don't forget to talk about that. So basically, um, if there's a question that I feel is going to be a major benefit for everyone in the room, I'll hold it for that. So I, I think that update question is another one. Um, now, aerosol can, I personally wouldn't recommend cron jobs for that, uh, for updating. You could have broken packages if you have a config file prompt that's hanging and then the server reboots and the package, you know, something wasn't fully installed or it's not necessarily wrong. It's just a, um, but there's other ways to do that. We'll say that. So yeah, that's, if there's nothing on the other end of a port, even if it's open, it could, um, that could happen. Uh, yeah, we'll be looking at that. So already about five more things to cover before the session's over. Um, so this one's going to be pretty packed, I think. It's going to be fun. Definitely, I'll make sure that's part of it. Just a couple more minutes, and we'll be right back at it.
Hi there, Tintin. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So we're almost ready to resume, and I think we're ready to resume. So there was a number of questions that came up that were extremely on topic and extremely good. And I decided instead of answering those questions when they were asked during the break, I wanted to hold them. So I'll be getting to those. Now, the first thing that I want to address is a comment that Aerosol Can made where it was noticed that the Apache version on the server is not the latest. So, but here's the interesting thing, and this is a, a very teachable moment here. I'm just going to attempt to update. I already know what's going to happen because I tried this off camera, but we're just going to do it so you guys can see it. I'm going to go and install updates right now. But wait a minute. It, it's saying that there's zero updates available. So if Apache is out of date, then what's going on here? Um, there's a new version of Apache, but I'm not being offered it. And there's a number of reasons why this could be the case. Sometimes there could be a delay in between a distribution updating. Usually when it comes to security, they're super quick about it. So that normally if your distribution is good, you're not going to really run into that. But Ubuntu, it's a love-hate kind of thing about this. What they sometimes do, and I think Debian does this sometimes, Red Hat, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know who does this the most. But what they'll do is they'll backport patches from a newer version to the version that's installed on the distribution or available on the distribution. So if you are seeing that Apache version X is installed, that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have patches from a newer version. Some distributions, they actually backport packages to the version they support. And I'm not saying that they did or did not backport this one. I, I'm, a, I'm going to make that assumption because it keeps happening. They always do this. But the problem, though, is that you as the administrator, you see Apache version X, but version Y is available. I mean, you could actually, if you have like a, a security dashboard, I mean, it could be flagged as out of date, even when the provider of the package did backport packages. So you can have all the benefits of the newer security patches, but still be an older version. And it's just kind of confusing. So I don't really like that. So the point is that there's more to it than the version number. I wish there wasn't, but it is what it is. Distributions will do what they do. Um, I'll be showing you guys some things here shortly that will um, kind of give you a better understanding of where you are in terms of security. But I'm not saying to ignore versions. Don't do that. You should still absolutely look at that. So aerosol can, you know what? Uh, yeah, everyone should do what you did and look at the versions and just at least understand the scope, especially considering Apache is publicly available. We definitely want to make sure that we have the patches for that. And if we're not getting the patches, that is a definite concern for real. So now another thing that I wanted to go over was I wanted to go back to CertBot. You remember earlier, this wouldn't even install. So I don't know what was going on. During the break, I tried it again, and it was like several seconds, and it was done. It was that easy. So maybe there's a newer version or something, and I might have caught them while they were updating it. I don't even know. But this is one of those issues where we had a problem. It resolved itself upstream. It was something on the other end. I used the VirtualBox example earlier. But we actually do have CertBot installed now. So that didn't work earlier, but it did work during the break. So we should be able to get that SSL certificate that I mentioned was so important. And since we have, uh, cert, uh, excuse me, since we have CertBot, uh, we could actually do the rest of the steps. So um, according to my notes, and this is also in the link for Nextcloud, we want to link snap bin certbot to user bin certbot. Again, certbot is a utility that you use with Let's Encrypt to get a TLS certificate. So now we have that. And then the final command for this should be sudo certbot dash dash Apache. But... Pay attention first to our next cloud server. Again, we have a, you may not be able to see this, but we have a padlock with the red X over it. So we don't have TLS at all. So we need some security here. We, we don't have that. We definitely want that for saving files. Oh my gosh, could you imagine if I had, if I had something like um, in files here, 
like maybe an accounting spreadsheet or something personal and it just wasn't secured that uh that makes me scared even thinking about it but you can fix that though by just running this command right here and i'll just do that i'm just filling out the form i'll say yes i agree uh no i don't want to share the fake email address that i gave it and i want server one so it's requesting a certificate right now. So this is another thing that should be on your security checklist anytime you deploy a server, make sure it's secure. So if I refresh this, let's see if it works. And it doesn't always by default set up redirect, but it did because we have the normal padlock here. It's HTTPS. So now we have a secure solution here. And there's other tweaks that I have in the video where we can make NextCloud specifically more secure, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. I just wanted to let you guys know that CertBot did install. Um, in yellow table, yes, yeah, snaps. I do understand the controversy to a point. Um, I feel like it it's a great technology, but there's just some edge cases that they should have worked out more. Um, there's definitely some flaws, and some of them are are kind of curious why they ended up in a um, you know Ubuntu 2204. But um, I feel like I want to go on my soapbox about that and rant a bit, but I'll do that on the YouTube channel because that's kind of better a better place to rant, I think, um, generally speaking. But yeah, I feel you on that for sure. That can be a thing. So moving on, um, and this, this is going to be, some of these things I'm going to go into are going, going to address some of the questions that came up earlier. Um, we should have the SS, excuse me, the SS command by default, and we do. Um, we'll get into that in a moment. But what I'm going to do is show you a way to find out what all ports are open on your server. I'm going to show you the old way, and then and then I'll show you the new way. So the new way requires a package to be installed on Debian and Ubuntu, at least, um, net-tools, which is no longer installed by default. I think it used to be. Um, it, it was quick. That was a, a very uh, quick command. And what that gives us is the nmap command. So what I'm going to do is run sudo nmap tulpn, um, nmap, 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 uh, bear with me one moment, netstat, of course. See, sometimes you get these confused. Netstat, because net nmap was what was being used earlier, um, by the way, and that was a good thing that someone tried that. Okay, so I'm going to try to make this font size a bit smaller here so it doesn't wrap as much. So I know the text is kind of hard to see, or maybe it is. I don't know how big it is on your screen. But when I run this and it's showing me the ports that are open, we can see that we have um, MySQL. Now it's localhost, it's 127. That's not really a big deal there. Uh, Apache via IPv6, we have the um, colons right there. So that's being served. So we're do what we're doing here is we're trying to find out what's all running. And we're not really concerned if it's running against a localhost IP, that's fine. But what we're concerned about, though, is if we see quad zeros like we see here, or in the in terms of IPv6, we have these uh, colons here, um, pretty much the same thing. I'm not going to get into IPv6, at least not today. But anyway, all zeros means that it's listening for connections on any IP, essentially. I'm oversimplifying it, but that you, you definitely want to pay attention to that. We've already handled this one, though, because when we set up the firewall earlier, even though the server is accepting connections from anywhere. All connections have to go through the firewall to get to the server. So the firewall will stop anything before it gets over to the server. Of course, there's vulnerability chains. There's uh, flaws in CVEs and firewalls that someone might be able to use to still get in, but I'm just speaking in basic terms here. The point, though, is to always know what's running on your server. Run this command. Um, the new one, as I mentioned that the tools aren't installed by default because they're being replaced. So what you just saw was the was an example of the netstat command, netstat-tulpn. But what I'm going to do is run a different one. And I run sudo because you get more information about the programs and the output. You don't always have to use sudo, though. I'm going to run the ss command, dash pl. And the output is going to look different. And it's so there's so much information. Like There's other flags here. Um, I don't want to go too far deep into this. We're just going to see the same information about what's open. Um, 
Personally, I like Netstat. I, I know that it's deprecated. We shouldn't be using it. And I definitely should not be advocating that anybody use something that's deprecated. But if we're only using it just to check our local server, I don't see a problem with that. And, and we could get the output of SS to look as clean as this too. Don't get me wrong, but we now know what's running on this particular server. And if you're running a port scan, then you already know what's running on my server. And uh, port scan is exactly what people on the outside will be doing. Now, what I want to do, though, let's make the font size larger, is move on to Linus. Not Linus, the person who made Linux, although that's pretty cool, too. What we want to do is install, and this is available for other distributions. It's called Linus, L-Y-N-I-S. So I'm going to install it. And this is so cool. Um, it's free. You just saw me install it. I didn't like uh, secretly open up my credit card and, and you know, buy this. Although you might think you probably, they should be charging money for this. Well, they do have an enterprise version. So that's how they make their money. Anyway, what does Linus do? So what I'm going to do, I'm pretty sure I need sudo for this. Anyway, so sudo Linus. And let me see if I can remember the command in my notes. Aha, I was right. It's, I should have trusted my judgment. It's audit system. So Linus audit system. After you install Linus, I recommend everybody run this on a server. If you're setting up a server, before you put it into production, run this on your server. Because what you're going to find is a lot of things wrong. And I don't care how good you are. This will still find flaws. And you're going to actually be surprised by how many things this thing will find. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, run this right here. So it might take a minute. I don't remember how long this takes. It's, it's going to scan the system looking for vulnerabilities. And it's not going to find every vulnerability that can be found, but it's definitely going to find a lot of them. So um, you'll get the output. And let me make the font smaller here. OK. So look at all this. I mean, I don't even have time to go through all this in a session here. There are so many things, like like literally 48 suggestions. Like in here I was thinking I was pretty good with a firewall and all my updates installed. And then, you know, later Aerosol Can found out that the version of Apache is not the latest. So we already knew there were problems, but did you think that there were 48 suggestions? There's five warnings. So I'll just scroll through. We even have kernel hardening stuff. You'll have to like literally Google the things that this finds because even someone like me that has like two decades, I don't have all these things memorized either. So uh, we have file integrity checks. There's just all kinds of things. And some of the things are, you might argue are not really that big of a deal, like the Etsy issue where it shows a message when you SSH in, they're calling that weak. I haven't changed it. Usually if you log into a company system, it'll say something like uh, authorized personnel only, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, al it's always good to have that. But I think if somebody is trying to break into a server, they don't really care about that warning because they've already made the decision to do what they're going to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I don't feel like adding something to issue.net is going to add to security unless somebody's paranoid or anxious. They might, oh, no, I better better stop. It's still good to do because it only takes a few minutes. And some companies have a legal requirement to have this anyway, that they have to make it known that you're not supposed to be doing this. So that's been said for legal reasons. So that's why that's here. So it could be a legal issue more than anything else. But that just goes to show you how deep Linus goes. And it is free. So all I had to do was run, let's see, sudo apt install Linus. And that's right in the Debian and Ubuntu repositories. It's on. It's in other distributions as well. There's a community free repository that they have on their website, which will get you a newer version of Linus because the version you get of Linus in the repository is probably not going to be the newest one. But if you get it from their repository, if you install their repository, you'll get a newer version, which is recommended. They have an enterprise version. Um, I, I don't you know, feel like, like, like that's even necessary to show you because I feel like the free information you get is, is plenty. Like, unless you have a requirement for a dashboard from your manager or something, it's probably just fine to use it like this. If nothing else, it'll tell you what it thinks is wrong with your server. 
just keep in mind there could be other things that's not detecting so don't feel like this is one single source of truth but it is a great a great way to know uh you know some of the things that you can change so that's linus now someone asked earlier about automatic updates now automatic automatic updates are extremely important actually but sometimes not the easiest thing now thankfully on ubuntu that's pretty easy at least there, there's some quirks we'll get into apt install unattended upgrades it's already installed in my case the defaults will actually install updates now, Linode's version, let's actually, I'll switch to root just to make sure I can get into it. Apt, I believe off the top of my head, it's app.com or conf.d. Nope, apt, apt.conf.d, I believe, yep. So inside there, we have uh, 50 unattended upgrades is one of the files. And this is very specific to um, Ubuntu, uh, and as well as Debian. Unintended upgrades. So if you go through here, you could see some of the, the default settings. So by default, it's going to automatically install security updates. We know this because the repositories, this is where you choose which repositories are automatically updated. Um, these are security repositories. And that's OK, because we want the security updates. We might not want feature updates. So if a program comes out the new version and there's no security benefit whatsoever, um, just new features. New features are probably fine. Uh, we definitely don't want backports or proposed sneaking in here. We definitely want the security updates. So the defaults are fine for what, what we need. Now, reboots are often necessary, depending on if the kernel was updated. Now, there's uh, I'm not going to go through all the settings here. But there's a way to tell it that it can reboot if you want to give it the ability to do that automatically. Like you could set it for 2 in the morning to reboot if you're not even using the server anyway. Um, and you just saw how easy that was. By default, just by installing that one package, we have unattended upgrades already. You should still keep an eye on this and not, you know, just assume it's working. Other distributions have, uh, you know, their own version of this kind of thing that you can install for free. That's usually the best way to get started. But there's also um, some quirks around this. Now, we installed Nextcloud manually. Okay. Now, unattended upgrades are only going to update the packages that are installed if you custom build anything or, or you know build something from source it's not going to update that so it's important to understand that unattended upgrades for example are for you know apt or distribution packages only when you start installing things like uh, nextcloud for example i mean you really do have to go to um in here and go to settings and there's a way to check the version just like any other app and you could update it right from there but is there a way to automate that sure there, there's a way to way to automate everything but that is a quirk to keep in mind that just because you have unintended upgrades installed doesn't mean it's working. Keep checking it just in case there's a failure. You don't want it to silently fail. Uh, also, just don't assume it's updating everything because some things it may not be. So another thing about updates is that there is a such a thing as live patching. And this, to me, just feels like black magic. Usually, a Linux server needs to be rebooted when there's a kernel update. Um, an aerosol can, I, I totally get your joke there. Um, a lot of Linux people brag about how long their server has been running, and I hate that so much. Is it the case that Linux servers can run for years without a reboot and still be you know, running just fine? Absolutely, that's true. Is it a good idea, though? Probably not, because if you have a kernel update, you have to reboot to be using the new kernel. So if someone's bragging, I have three years of kernel or three years of runtime or uptime rather. And you can find out, by the way, just by running uptime, that tells you how long it's been up. Um, it's been up one hour and 45 minutes, according to this. But when someone says that their server has been running for three years straight, I'm like, yeah, you're use probably using a kernel from three years ago and you could be impacted by every security vulnerability that came out since then. Congratulations, you have a very insecure server in exchange for uptime. Um, and I know a lot of like hardcore Linux people would be like turning red by hearing me say that, but it is absolutely the truth. But live patching, what it aims to do though, is make reboots unnecessary if the kernel is updated. So it can actually live patch the running kernel. So you don't have to reboot. And this wasn't the case until recently. This is a recent addition here. 
But just imagine that you're running on a server, a live patch, a running kernel. That's crazy to me. The issue with this, though, is that while the kernel, the Linux kernel itself, supports this, it's built right into the kernel. The kernel doesn't give you a user space utility. There's no like app you can click on or anything or um, what have you to make that happen. The the kernel supports the live live patches, but you out you basically end up paying a company for the privilege. And this is kind of where the quirk is. Ubuntu, for example, gives you, I believe, three machines for free. So what that means is they'll let you live patch three machines without payment. And if you're running Ubuntu on your desktop, you can have live patching on your desktop for free. If, if it's within three, you, if you have a server, maybe you have a laptop, a desktop, and a server, there's three. You can have live patch installed in those and you wouldn't need to pay for it. Uh, but that, you know, Ubuntu's, um, you know, program there is specific to Ubuntu. But what if you run Fedora and you also run OpenSUSE? Okay, you might be paying, oh, if you're a company, OpenSUSE for their live patch. If you have Red Hat, you might be paying them for theirs. And then you have an uh, Ubuntu um, management subscription. Now you're paying them. You're paying a bunch of different companies for the privilege. And that's where it kind of gets uh, messy. There is a service called TuxCare. I'm not, they are a sponsor of my channel, just to give that disclaimer, but I actually use them. They support you know, multiple distributions through one, and that's called TuxCare. So somebody also asked earlier about a dashboard. Uh, you could absolutely get that with TuxCare. Again, disclaimer, they are a sponsor of the channel, so I'm not trying to make this, uh, you know, make J money kind of thing. That's not what this is. So I'm not going to give you any links or anything like that. You can Google TuxCare on your own privately if you want to do that. I just want to make sure that you guys know that these solutions exist. But if nothing else, um, you can at least install something like unattended upgrades to make that happen automatically. There is a way to set up an email server for outbound where it'll email you if there's a problem, so that way you can keep an eye on it. So that's, you know, there's there's so much more we can get into when it comes to updating, but that's definitely something that I wanted to um, to go over. So right now, I've gone over the majority. There's, I mean, there's so many things to go over when it comes to security. I feel like, um, I feel like there's just, I could do two more hours and probably still not be done yet. So I kind of chose the most common things that, uh, you know, people generally install a runner up that almost made it. And I will mention this because it's good to use uh, fail to ban. So it's it's all together fail, F-A-I-L, number two. So the, so the number two and then ban, fail to ban. It's available in Linux distributions and you could have that watch your log files and it'll literally add a firewall rule to block. Like if somebody's trying the password more than more times than you're comfortable with, you can set it to block them for an hour. So maybe they try five times, they get blocked. Then an hour later, they get five more attempts to get blocked. That massively slows down brute force attempts to the point where they're just not even feasible anymore. Because if you think about a outside attacker trying thousands of passwords a minute, imagine if they could only try five passwords at a time and then they get blocked because they could try five more. Fail to ban is very complicated. I shouldn't say very complicated. It's easy to get started with, but you start to get into regular expressions and things that are uh, probably not going to happen in the 22 minutes that we have left today. So I just want to let you guys know that fail to ban exists. That's um, covered in my book. It's covered in many other books and videos um, on my channel as well. So there's definitely, uh, definitely check that out. Another runner up was CrowdSec, which is a, a newer technology. That's a lot like fail to ban. And it's also free. Now, what I like about them is that everybody that has CrowdSec installed, if any one of them has an intrusion attempt, then the CrowdSec agent will uh, will actually notify all the other ones about it. So everybody with CrowdSec, if you mess with one, you're messing with them all. And it's so brilliant because um, the reputation database is centralized. So if a IP is causing trouble, it's added to that database and all CrowdSec protected servers check that and will block. And it's free. I mean, there is a, a disclaimer. There's a company corporate um, pro version that they have available, but the free one is fine. You could absolutely install the free one. I have videos on that. Um, that was a runner up. Didn't make it for this demonstration, but I just wanted to let you guys know that it exists. So at this point, what I would like to do is open this up to questions from you guys. Switch back to my camera here. And uh, go ahead and ask your questions. 
And that about wraps it for today. Again, I can go two more hours talking about security and all these fun things, but um, you know, I got to be respectful of other time and there's uh, other great sessions. So um, don't want you guys to miss out. So go ahead and ask your questions. I, there might be a delay. I know when I use uh, StreamYard on my YouTube channel, there's usually a, something like a 30 second delay when people start asking questions before I see them. So, and it could be Linux related in general at this point or related to what we're going over today. So um, no requirement there. If there's not enough questions, we can end the session a bit early, but uh, if you guys have questions, I'll go right up to time, no problem. Ubuntu versus Pop! OS about security. That's a great one. Okay, so one school of thought is that Pop! OS is built on Ubuntu's base. So that does mean that they take advantage of those security updates, but you can't consider Ubuntu uh, or Pop! OS Ubuntu, which you didn't. I'm not saying you did. But in general, the um, argument is that Pop! OS is just Ubuntu with a fresh coat of paint. It's not. It's a completely different distribution, and it should be considered as much. Now, it's really hard to know when it comes to security because obviously any package that they pull from the Ubuntu base is going to have those security updates in there. Pop! OS includes newer software because they have their own repository. So one example of this is a new version of Thunder Thunderbird a couple of years back. Ubuntu wanted nothing to do with packaging that because it was such a big change. So they just kept, uh, you know, offering security updates for the version of Thunderbird that they had, but they didn't give you the latest version of Thunderbird. But um, Pop! OS did. They, 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 in their repository, they absolutely packaged the new version of Thunderbird, which is great because, in a way, because that means you get that piece of software. You wouldn't get in Ubuntu. You get that in Pop! OS. That happens all the time. Now, the problem is, if there's a security flaw in a newer version of a piece of software, you might run into a problem there. To be fair, even if Pop! OS didn't do that, there's still flat packs, another package version. Those can pull in new versions as well. So I feel like Pop! OS is generally secure, but also I feel like you should never trust anything by, excuse me, I don't feel like you should ever trust anything by default either. So um, absolutely look at things, look at package versions, run Linus on your system. If you have a very important piece of software, you have to maintain that it's new. And I've seen so many times where people will regularly update all of their updates, install all their updates. What happens though is they aren't looking at each of the repositories. So if a repository for a application like a PPA, which is a smaller repository, has a newer app in there, and that's why you generally install it until one day it doesn't. And the person who maintains that repository, they get burned out, unfortunately, they kind of move on, life changes, they, they just don't want to be involved in that anymore. Chances are you're not going to know, and you're installing your updates, and you keep that up, but you do, unless you look at your versions, you won't know that one piece of software that you installed a repository for has been out of date for the past year, unless you're looking at it. So it's kind of like a situation where anything you use, you have to be able to tell and look for yourself to see if it's secure, and don't just trust by default that your distribution is doing the right thing. Many of them do, but they're also made by humans and we make mistakes like you've seen me make at the beginning of this session. So um, let's see. I yep, I believe you would be able to rewatch the uh, session. That's my understanding. Yep, oh, you, you already answered that. Rosendo. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I'm scrolling through to see if there's anything that I missed. Yes, aerosol can about Linus who obliterated his Pop! OS desktop environment. That video made me so angry because, um, you know, somebody with that level of a of an audience, I mean, my YouTube channel is huge. It is not Linus Tech Tips huge, right? Um, he has, oh, I think at one point I checked, he had in subscribers what I had in entire views, right? So he has a lot more people. Um, it's just interesting that he's using the command line because you should never have to do that unless you are a server admin, a Linux admin. For desktop use, there's no reason no reason to use a command line unless you like it. So to see him use the command line, I'm like, why? Don't. Like you just, just get the flat pack or um and I still don't know exactly what he did wrong. I have theories and on what happened, but I just feel like he did a major disservice to Linux. And I don't think that was cool. Does Linux have quirks and issues? Sure it does. Nothing's perfect, but um, the problem that Linus had, that problem doesn't actually happen. So that that's why I was a little annoyed by that. Um, so I think he's become famous as the failure of a Pop! OS user. But 
Um, to his uh, defense, I do understand content schedules and how hard it is to find the time and things like that. So I do understand there, there's probably a time crunch there too. So sometimes it's really hard to get the finer details. Um, tips on security on daily driving Arch Linux desktop. So Arch Linux does a great job with security from what I've seen. I use Arch Linux a lot. It's not my daily driver, but I always make sure that I have at least one installation of Arch because I like it a lot. Um, I've seen their security updates come in the same day as a vulnerability being announced. So um, I don't watch it every day. So the last time I looked at Arch Linux, it was pretty spot on. It didn't have any problems with security. Now, when it comes to daily driving Arch, you have other problems because um, Arch is one of those things that since it's a rolling distro, it's going to go well or very bad, one of the two. But what I found the best way, in my opinion, is to have some kind of a system to snapshot I was using LVM snapshots at one time. The idea being that you could create a snapshot of your installation. Uh, time shift is another one that's famous. It doesn't matter which one you use. And then you take a snapshot of your system before you before you install your updates, reboot. And if anything is not working correctly, just uh, restore your snapshot, wait a day, and then just try it again. And that alone will probably solve 95% or more of the issues that you could ever have with Arch. It, it just makes it a completely different distribution because with that, um, you don't live or die by whether or not packages are working or not. You could restore the snapshot if anything isn't acting right, and then you can go back to it and install it because, um, and I'm not talking about security updates here, although you can include that. It's just, there's mostly feature updates in Arch. They're gonna have a lot of feature updates, sometimes hundreds of updates a week. So. You gotta have a way of managing that without being a victim to it. So I find personally that um, snapshots are the way to go. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, let's see. Okay, so Tim Tin about WSL um, or whether you install it as a main operating system in the virtual machine or on your computer. That kind of depends on one thing. If you work for a company and they mandate like uh, Windows, for example, my preference is that Linux should be on the metal. That, that's just where it should be. Putting it now, it, VMs are absolutely perfect too, because you know Linux was built for that. So bare metal and VMs, absolutely, no question, no no hesitation for that. Um, now, virtual machines depends on what you're using, because if it's GPU related, um, like gaming, you could use pass through and things. But generally speaking, that's when you start to run into trouble. But if you don't really need advanced 3D acceleration, virtual machines are almost always fine. The GNOME desktop just drags in VirtualBox. You'd probably want to use something else for that. But if you can get Ubuntu as your primary operating system, that's always the best if you can do that. Now, if you work for a company that, man that mandates um, Windows on the workstations, then WSL could be your only way of actually getting a Linux experience. It's not going to run as fast, as efficiently. It's not going to be exactly the same thing as a bare metal install. But if you have no other option, if your company doesn't allow you to uh, you know, take Windows off the computer and then put Linux on there, um, shame on that company, by the way. That's horrible. But if that's what it is, I mean, that's what it is. You can't change the company's policy. So WSL is, I think, a great way to get some kind of compromise for um, having Linux, especially if you have an IT team and some do have stigma still about Linux for no good reason, then that just might be a good compromise to get you a Linux install you can use and you get all the benefits there. Um, one thing I like about WSL, and I tested this once, it was kind of crazy. I just randomly chose a GUI text editor on Linux and I installed it and it showed up on the Windows desktop. I'm like, that's pretty cool. So if I had no other choice, I would, uh, I'd at least be happy knowing I can do that. So any other questions? I don't see any questions in a minute or two. Then, uh, we'll go. oh, best practice on file permissions. File permissions. So, assuming that is data that you that isn't public, like something in your home directory, make your home directory uh, seven hundred. Um, that's a numerical version, which means your the owning user has full access to it, um, and everything underneath that should be six hundred or seven hundred. Because I just don't see a reason why some distributions default to Every user being able to reach your home directory, that's just weird. I don't think that's something we want. And some distributions, I think Ubuntu among them has changed that. So that's not the case. Some distributions have, some some have not. So I would at least do that if you can. If it's something that's shared 
among like a, a you know Apache config or something that's a that's served, then the owner and the group, um, at least the owner could be read write. Uh, the group probably read write as long as you have the group membership restricted. Others should be just nothing, um, unless you have a reason for everyone to see it. Um, as long as the web server user is able to see it, nothing else really matters anyway. So I'd be very, very careful about what you allow everyone to view. But by default, it's probably fine. 90% of the time that the user and group have access, that's probably OK. All right, so hopefully that answered that for you. All right, so I'm going to call it right here. Um, I'll just say this um, in closing. Thank you guys so much. It's been so amazing. Uh, I love teaching you guys. I love doing these, and I hope to do more of these. Also, check out learnlinux.tv. Type that right in your browser, and you can go to my uh, website. Uh, all, my YouTube videos are there. Um, UbuntuServerBook.com if you want to check out the new one that's coming that covers Ubuntu 2204. That would be pretty cool. But even if you don't do that, you have all the free videos and things right there on the website. So um, without even opening opening up your pocketbook, you have like hundreds of videos you can watch that I've done over the years. I can't even believe how many I've done. So, um, you know, some people charge tens of thousands of dollars for this. Um, well, maybe not quite that much. I hope not. But they charge a lot of money for these types of things, but it's there for free. So definitely utilize that. Hopefully you'll learn a few things. And um, I'm hoping to do this again. So I had a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks so much again, Jay. And um, yep. thank you all for joining us. It's been great. If you want to stick around, there's going to be some more content coming up from Global Hack Week in it. And for now, yeah, definitely check out the learnlinux.tv website that Jay told you about. And also check out Linode's uh, YouTube channel. There's a ton of content from Jay there as well. And be sure to participate in our Linode challenges throughout the week. Awesome. Right, thank you. Yes. Have a good one, y'all. Take it easy.